talk a little bit individually about um, what what each of them does, and then talk about how they how they worked out their collaboration, um, and probably give at least one example of a child who benefited from that collaboration. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Richard and Jim. My name is Richard. I'm a behavior analyst and I value speech language pathologist. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my buddy. She's a speech language pathologist. <laughs> so is she, and I'm comfortable where I'm sitting. <laughs> so Shannon and I uh, met um, around 2005, mm -hmm. and I work for an agency, and she is uh, in private practice. And our paths have crossed multiple times over the years, uh, both through uh, the preschool intervention program that I've been involved with, and more recently and commonly through private clients. And I'll pass it over to you. Okay. So we wanted to show you just how much we're sharing. We actually have one piece of paper that we're sharing. <laughs> um, so uh, we thought we'd give you a, an example, a couple of examples of clients that we share and how that's worked out. Um, so I'll tell you about the first one, and Richard can tell you about the second one. So we currently and uh, both support a girl in North Vancouver who, has, who is about six years old and has ASD. And um, the, the example here is um, when we're both consulting for a client, we hardly ever see each other. Occasionally we do see each other at meetings, but it doesn't happen very often. So we usually need to have somebody who is the conduit for information. Um, for some teams, that does work out if you're writing everything down, but hardly anybody reads all those notes, right? Um, so in this particular case, we have a really wonderful one-to-one um, -one support worker, behavior interventionist, um, who works with this little girl. And she does therapy with her every day and also uh, is present at all the team meetings. So she sees both of us every week, and, uh, and then does see the home team as well. So an example of something that we've been working on with her is prepositions. So she needed to learn some prepositions. She didn't have many. And um, so we decided as a team that that was an important goal for her. And then uh, my role was to come up with the specific targets that she was going to work on. Um, and so I did that, and then um, I went into the school and uh, modeled how to teach those and what that would look like. Um, and then I asked Richard if he would kindly provide a data sheet that would fit within the, the program for the, for, that would fit with the rest of her program. So then um, the behavior interventionist has a, a great way to keep data. And, um, and then as each of us goes in every week and consults on this little girl, then the, oops, then the uh, behavior interventionist tells us what the problems are. So she's running into some difficulty, and Richard's able to problem solve with her and figure out some changes that we need to make. Um, and so he made some changes on, um, on exactly how we were going to uh, do those targets and a little bit of change in the targets. And then when I came in the next time, I made some more changes. Um, we needed to add some text prompts for her. And that really worked well, and she made some good progress, and then she got stuck again, and then we problem solved again, and uh, we keep on working at it. Um, but we know that she's making improvements every week because um, there is data, and, uh, and the behavior interventionist feels supported um, because she knows she's not going to be working on a target that's not going anywhere. Um, and the little girl's communicating more. So, over to you. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about, is that working? The other thing around that case is the, um, the SEA in question also works on the home team. We have monthly home team meetings, and Shannon is only occasionally able to attend the home team meetings, um, but the SEA is always there. And so we have a, an item on our monthly agenda, school update that includes SLP. So the SEA, who sees Shannon weekly, will share uh, what the progress has been over the last month, what the current things are, which also informs the home interventionist so that they can include those things in natural environment teaching, through incidental opportunities, and uh, more, probably more importantly, informs the parents of what's being done at school on those particular things so that they can be brought into bath time and kitchen routines and things like that in, in every, everyday situations. The other case we had was for uh, a young man who's now in grade 9 in high school, 
And we've both known, known him for a number of years. And one of his interventionists is here who's known him for eight years. Um, hi, Leanne. <laughs> and uh, there are a few things that are in collaboration for him. One was uh, he works on the, the he's, or he's worked on in the past on the language for learning program, um, a structured direct instruction methodology that uh, overlapped nicely with the school curriculum. And one of the things that came out of the direct instruction was trouble with verbs. And so we needed to break out and have a special instructional program to teach this kiddo verbs. And Shannon was at a team meeting where we were discussing this and suggested a, a resource as far as a stimuli that we could use that I was unaware aware of um, and wouldn't have known about if Shannon hadn't been there. So we based the, the, um, the instruction of verbs around this particular material and got great mileage out of it. And so that was uh, you know, just a, a little example of um, a collaboration where we shared materials and that worked very, very effectively. The other thing for this young man is he's moved into grade nine. I mean, social skills are always important, but his mom in this case, the mother is the conduit of information. She's very, very active, and she recognizes that I don't have all the answers, and Shannon doesn't have all the answers, and the school doesn't have all the answers. So she puts together a good team where we all communicate. And uh, this young man now goes to see Shannon for social thinking groups, which I don't have the expertise to deliver and, and wouldn't fit into the home program, but he does that on a, week, on a weekly basis. And we have it built into our team meeting agenda, and mom shares what's happening in the social thinking groups and the language that's being used, because his interventions do take him into the community with peers. So we um, are able to generalize those terms in functional settings. And mom communicates those terms with the school. And because I go into the school on a monthly basis, I'm able to check in on the SEA's use of those terms in social situations at school where it matters the most. That's what we had. <laughs> Um, so we work together with two 16-year-old, 16 and 17, yep. I guess now. Um, we've worked with them for the past two and a half years. Uh, I was referred, which was great, and I do almost exclusively social thinking groups, or groups and use a lot of social thinking in them. Um, so the way that we've been working is we did a lot of collaboration at the beginning. Uh, so when they started group, we did lots of work on what am I introducing, here's what I've been working on, how's it going to fit at home, mm -hmm. and what are we doing at home that I can implement in group. So um, we don't see them together very much. We don't even see each other very no. much. Um, but it's worked really, really well. From my point of view, I can introduce concepts in group, and I know that they're being worked on at home. Um, and they're really being understood by the school team, and I have no doubt that they've made massive progress because of our model and how it's worked. Yeah. I think for our model, the parents, again, are the conduit of the messenger between us because we don't see each other very often. We would like to see each other more, but it's just not possible. Um, so when I see the individuals, I only see the individuals um, once a month at school and then for one uh, student and then the other student I see him twice a month, once at home, one at school, one time at school. So Jenny actually gets to see the kids more than I do. And the mom keeps me and the team informed about what the strategies are that Jenny is using and then we incorporate them into our home-based program. So um, for the perspective taking particularly, I think that Jenny's brought a huge um, amount of knowledge and scope to our programming. It's like Richard said, I don't have the expertise to do the social thinking piece that Jenny does. So that's been really, really important. I think um, for one of the individuals in particular, he's a big guy, he's 17, he doesn't understand that he scares people. So the idea that when you are standing up big and tall and staring at somebody over them, that that's intimidation and that scares them. And so we use the red and the blue thoughts and he's starting to understand that he scares people when he does that. And so we've developed strategies like when you want to talk about something and you're upset, you need to sit down and talk about it because when you stand up, you scare people. And so now we're teaching him to say, will you sit and talk with me? And that's helping with the, you know, keeping people having blue thoughts versus red thoughts. and. Um, those were strategies, and I feel like I was really at a place with both students where I had sort of come to the end of my experience and my breadth, um, my scope with teaching conversation and social skills, and Jenny really added to that. So I think, um, I think it's been a great collaboration, and like Jenny said, uh, it's working really well for me too. If they're, you know, the, the parents in this case have been so helpful because we don't see each other, so it's been really, really good. And both parents will come to either of us with problems, and sometimes I say, "Ah, talk to Jenny about that." And um, I know that sometimes you've done the opposite, and so even though we don't get to talk about it together, we even work through the parent to come to problem solve together. So yeah. um, it's been really good. 
The, the only negative we had with it was <laughs> um, Sharon had apparently been trying to extinguish Thomas the Tank Engine for quite a while when I introduced the whole electronic train tattoo group. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> so a little miscommunication. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> we faded it over here. <laughs> Um, so, Gina and I work for the Reach Quality Development Society, and so I think we're in a unique and fortunate position compared to, um, uh, not fortunate compared to others, but I think a unique position in that we work for the same agency. So, we work together on the um, multidisciplinary team, along as well with occupational therapists. So, we have um, BCBA and then OT and SLP, so those are kind of the three components to our service. And so it's a bit different in that we, um, by virtue of how it's set up, because we work for the same employer, there's a lot of collaboration that happens right from the beginning because we all do work together. So in terms of our assessment process, um, we each have domains that we're responsible for. So Gina is responsible for the communication domain and then the different sort of subdomains within that and I address uh, primarily cognition or sort of academic skills and play. And then the occupational therapist um, deals with self-help skills and fine motor. Those are the two main areas there. So in terms of kind of how we approach assessment and intervention, each of us assesses the child um, underneath those different domains. And then together we write the report. So each person writes their own section, but there's a lot of discussion that does happen prior and ongoing, obviously. I mean, being in the same building, being in the same physical space all the time, we just have that luxury of being able to communicate with each other a lot, which is a real um, fundamental component of our approach in working together as a team. So we each write our different portions of the plan of intervention, um, but there certainly is a lot of overlap. Um, for example, play. I mean, that would be an area that we do a lot of collaboration discussion about. Um, but depending on the model, because we have both a center and home-based model, but say in the center model, we have monthly team meetings. So again, sort of that luxury of being able to meet on a monthly basis with the family and talk to them about how things are going with the child and the um, intervention sessions and then making tweaks or adjustments as needed and looking at ways that we can kind of cross fertilize, you know, collaborate on things together. Maybe I'll stop there and let you. Mm. I don't, yeah. I don't think there's a great deal more to add, um, but we do have the luxury of having also clinical meetings on a monthly basis. Right. So then that allows Two all, times a month. Yeah, sorry, twice a month. So that allows all team members, because um, we obviously have a number of teams going, um, to talk about all the different children. So then again, that allows us another opportunity to deepen our uh, understanding of, and perspective of each other's professions. Um, and it allows us all to sort of have a shared knowledge base with regard to ABA principles and practice, as well as um, the other <laughs> disciplines that we represent. So we're very fortunate to be able to do that as well. Um, and also, you know, we're all in the homes each month or, or visiting the programs. Um, and we all write up those notes, which are then in a shared file, so we can all review each other's notes mm -hmm. as well, which is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think certainly, you know, at REACH, it's been a process over time of learning how to work so closely together, because it, it, I mean, it's not as though there haven't been challenges. Um, you know, it's, as I say, been a, kind of an evolutionary process, and the team that consists now is a very stable team. It's been there for a number of years, the same kind of core senior team, and so that has really allowed us to deepen our knowledge and, and broaden our knowledge in terms of working together, um, learning from each other, talking about different issues, how we can kind of um, collaborate on particular goals or teaching a child certain strategies or using certain strategies, teaching a child particular skills, um, and whether it's something like I think Richard was maybe talking about it, you know, designing a data collection sheet, right, to address some of the goals, to think about, okay, how are we going to measure this? How do we know, you know, how do we stay accountable in terms of what's happening with this particular domain, this goal? And so maybe then um, having some discussion and then maybe me providing some suggestions or examples of, you know, okay, this is how I would try and measure that, and then sort of tweaking. And so, I mean, as I say, we're in a unique position and very fortunate and... 
to have everybody kind of together in under the same roof. Hi, I'm Janice, and I'm here with Mary, which is one of the and um, behavioral consultants. And we work together. Mary works with me, but also with other speech pathologists in our region. And I also work not only with Mary, but with other behavioral consultants um, in our region as well. Um, so, uh, uh, you, I guess you have to talk first. Okay. Um, so, in, um, the kind of program that I have for kids is a home-based program. Oh, yeah. um, so, and, and as part of that home-based program, um, the behavior interventionists that go in and provide intervention to the child. Um, I see the kids in their home. I can also see them in their preschool or daycare. Um, as I think that kids need support in all these different community center, uh, settings, right? Sometimes uh, the behavior interventionists also provide support to kids in the community programs like gymnastics or um, the Christmas parade or something. Um, so because children you know, with autism are part of our community and they attend these various programs in the community, I think that's one of the reasons why collaboration is so important um, because they do need support in these areas. And in terms of what collaboration looks like for Janice and I, um, I also work with other speech pathologists in our community, so there are no hard and fast rules about what it looks like. Um, it really depends on the child and on the family and about how we feel the best way of, uh, of working together is. So what we're going to do today is try and um, uh, talk about our particular experience working together, but then also... Um, taking into account the other speech pathologists in our community because we've gotten input from them today about what they would like us to include in, in our presentation. So um, the kids with uh, autism require a comprehensive program um, and according to the MCFD handbook, kids under six require a behavioral plan of intervention. And um, it's the responsibility of the behavior consultant to write up that program in, in, in consultation with the family and with other team members. And you know that's what I try to do with Janice and with the other SLPs that I work with. Um, I certainly can write the communication goals because I am a speech language pathologist, but um, there are so many areas to work on with these kids. I think it's important to reach out and collaborate with the SLPs and with OTs because there's so much that needs to be done. And uh, I don't feel that I need to do everything. Um, in the domains outlined in the, in the behavioral plan of intervention, there are social skills, play skills, communication, emotional functioning, self-regulation, academic, fine motor, gross motor, sensory function, and life skills. And speech language pathologists do have an expertise in social skills, and play skills, and communication development. And um, um, so I think it's very important that speech pathologists are involved in writing those goals. Um, Yes. Do you want to keep going? Oh, no. um, so, yeah, so I collaborate with Janice on some of the speech and language goals for kids. Um, primarily with young children, I use the early start general model checklist. I really like that. Um, I really like that it, it incorporates um, play based intervention and that incorporates ADA as well as more naturalistic strategies, which is, I think is a nice uh, um, union between my speech and language background and the ADA background or my ADA training. Um, and so, um, one thing that Janice and I have done with some particular goals is she might take on a goal um, in her in her sessions and, then, and then let me know how those are progressing in her sessions, and then let us know so that we can incorporate it in the home program. So, for example, uh, prepositions. She might look at um, teaching the child understanding, receptive understanding of prepositions. And once she has the data that shows that the child's understanding it pretty consistently in the clinic setting, she'll let us know in the home setting. She'll usually fire off an email. And so then what we'll do is, in the behavior interventions myself, we'll think about ways that we can incorporate that in the home setting and in the daycare setting to, to facilitate that generalization. Um, so I won't probe the prepositions. I, I, I'll maybe when, when she tells me about it. But initially, I take my lead from Janet, or from Janice. <laughs> Um, as to when and where and when what time I'm going to introduce prepositions. 
Um, so yeah, so the, the, the kids I work with have a home-based program, so intervention takes place primarily in the home, although it can take place in community settings like gymnastics or in uh, preschool settings. Um, and in general, the parents are the head of the program, which I think we're hearing from everybody here. One parent uh, referred to me as the quarterback of the team, mm -hmm. and so in using that analogy, the, the parent would be the coach of the program, the child's team. Um, so what I try to do for the, for, um, the, the child's program is I provide training um, to the behavior interventionists, the early childhood educators, and the support workers on specific strategies and um, how we're going to measure um, the child's program. And the behavior interventionists implement that program at home, as I said, in the community settings. And I provide ongoing inter or supervision to the behavior interventionists, and I supervise implementation of the program and update the goals when appropriate. And I provide ongoing support and training to the family based on their wants and needs. But that would be something that I would talk with a speech pathologist about, because if their communication strategies, the speech language pathologist might work with the child at home or with the parent at home to, to develop those strategies. Um, same with the daycare. Um, it might be me going into the daycare, or it might be Janice going into the daycare or preschool. It, it just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, as Mary alluded to earlier, often we're working on the same goals. So for example, for a child, we're working on pretend play skills, sequence, sequence pretend play skills. So she was working on that with her team at home, and then when the child could do it at home, we were watching for generalization in, in the daycare. And when that wasn't happening, I went in to coach the support worker to how to do that, how to support her pretend play skills for this little girl. Um, so it's really lovely working with Mary because she is a speech pathologist. We didn't have to spend a lot of time getting to know each other, trying to understand where our different perspectives are. And that is certainly, you need to do that more so with obviously a person who, who's not a speech pathologist, who's a, a behavioral consultant. And, and I'm, I'm, what I'm really liking about today is that we are learning some strategies how to do that. I really appreciate uh, Tracy's presentation today and has really given me some strategies to reach out to, to some other consultants that I work with that it, it is hard, has been hard for a number of reasons to connect. Um, so that was wonderful. And one of the things I think about the way we, we uh, work together is because we're both speech pathologists, but also recognizing our similar, we're able to recognize how we work similarly. And one of the ways we work similarly is we, we're both be behaviorists in many ways. I mean, I take data, I, I watch a child, I probe, I take, take my data, I record it. My, our, our agency requires us to record our data every day after every, after every session. So it's easy then to say to Mary, hey, you know, this, for this target, we're at 20%. What, what can we do here to facilitate this, get it going more? So and that's nice that it goes both ways, and Mary is able to tell me the same thing. Um, yeah, I think, and of course with collaboration, it all takes time. And fortunately, because Mary and I know each other well, is that I can just have a two-line email. I can tell her, right, I don't have to start with nice flowery language. How are you today? And how are things going? I hope you're doing all right. And by the way, can you do this, right? So it's just one or two sentences, we're done. And it takes two minutes to do. So it's, that's what's also really nice, that when we don't have time to meet, at least there are other ways, quick and dirty ways that we can connect. Yeah, so some of the advantages I believe are that ultimately I think the child's um, children are better served with collaboration. We kind of touched on this in the programs or the presentations this morning. Um, it results in a sharing of assessment and program information so that we can develop these common goals. Um, and the children benefit from it, uh, generalization skills, um, learning from uh, multiple teachers. That's really important for some of these kids because, as I um, think um, Pat said that sometimes as a, as, a, as a teacher you don't know what you might be prompting the child to do. Even, you might not even know that you're prompting the child's uh, response. Um, and you know sometimes there have been challenges. Um, and one speech pathologist that I worked with, with one child, it was a child who was becoming verbal but it was, it was kind of slow and he, um, he, he seemed to be very prompt dependent, so that his, his you know, single, word level, single word level maybe he used like 25 words, but they were all mostly imitative. And um, usually I have two meetings with the team and the parents and the, the speech pathologist, and um, 
when I watched the interventions, interventions working with this child and I watched the parents, it seemed to me that the, the people were prompting the child um, to get an imitated response, but they weren't fading that prompt. And I was kind of wondering, oh, maybe if they just faded their prompt, we could get language to come, become more spontaneous. And we talked about this at the meeting, um, because the speech pathologist was suggesting that we introduce the PECs, which, you know, certainly I've done with kids. And I said, I said to me, can we take another month, look at how we're teaching, and look at really trying to fade our prompts to see if we can get him to develop more spontaneous speech. Um, and we all agreed, okay, we'll give it another month and, and month and see how this looks. And I went in and I talked to the parents and the behavior interventionists about, we really need to fade that prompt so that it's not always imitated. And he was at the very stages of, the requesting stage would be what Hannon would call it, or manding, which would be what verbal behavior would call it. Um, and in the month, and we, took, we took data, we took data on um, what level of prompting he needed for specific words. Um, so we, were, we recorded the data, and, it, and a month later when we all got together, we looked at the data and we were able to say, you know what, he's got 20 spontaneous words now. Um, and we decided then as a team that we didn't need to introduce the PECs, which is a really labor-intensive thing to do. Um, and it was really because we kind of looked more closely at our teaching. And, and the speech pathologist was really receptive to that. And, um, and, you know, it was through that collaboration that we were able to move on with the child's program. Um, so I think uh, we talked about communication here between speech pathologists and behavior consultants. And I do think that's key um, to collaboration. Um, so there are a few challenges associated with collaboration. I'll let Jenna talk to those. I think I already did. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. No, We're not really following our notes. Yeah. Um, okay, so basically, um, the other thing I wanted to add is that collaboration does take time and resources are limited. And as professionals, it's up to us to find an efficient and effective way of doing this because, you know, we really want to provide quality service to these kids, which is one of the things that Tracy alluded to, is that that's our common goal here, are the kids and their families. Thank you very much.